Um, well, welcome again. I, uh, my name is Andrew, if you don't know who I am, pastor here, uh, Bible Fellowship Church. And just again, real briefly, I, I want to just say welcome. Uh, we, are, we are a people who don't claim to have it all together. Um, we, we're not perfect. Uh, we're not a perfect church. Uh, we have our warts and all, um, but we know a perfect God who perfectly loves us in his son. There is a real God. He really exists. He really loves you. And he has demonstrated it in his son, Jesus, who came and lived a life of perfection, holding up a standard that we could never hold up, uh, dying a death that we deserved, rising again from the dead, and saying, I will give you new life if you just believe in me. And so we gather together weekly to worship, uh, to remind ourselves of the truth and the goodness of his grace. Uh, You come in, you see a sign that says, we're faith and fellowship, create a family. We hope to try to be that. That's what we're striving towards. Uh, Again, we're not doing it perfectly. Uh, But we are are seeking to be a place where we represent what the, the family of God is called to look like where we bear with one another in our burdens, uh, where we serve one another, uh, where we help one another grow uh, in what it means to know and to follow and to serve Jesus with our lives. Uh, we, are, we are helping each other along the way. And I just want to say thank you. Uh, a lot of the, Some of the men aren't here, but last week was a great example of the health of our body. Um, we don't like difficulties. Right? We don't like inconveniences. Uh, driving into an icy parking lot, it's not, I mean, for some people, that's a fun thing. Let's just be honest. Um, but it's not necessarily what we would say, you know what, this is what I want to do on Sunday morning. I want to get up, go out in the cold, uh, potentially slip and fall, go, and I, maybe I'll stay home and, and plug in online. Uh, but when things like that happen, there are opportunities for us to see uh, God's people step up. And in a very real way, God's people stepped up. We had many, many of you guys helping those who were uh, not so sure of themselves on the ice. We had uh, just people stepping up and a valet service just popped out of the blue, which again, it's sorry, it's not going to happen every week. Um, Or maybe, I don't know, maybe there's a ministry out there. I don't don't know. Um, But just people stepping up and saying, hey, here's a need. How can I help? I I know how to drive cars. I'm pretty good. Like, help. Let me help. And I was getting feedback from people just saying, thank you so much for, uh, for I just, I just want to say thank you so much. It meant so much to me to see God's people showing their love to God's people um, and strong helping the weak, weak helping the strong, vice versa. So I just want to say thank you. I mean, that's, I think it's a really cool. Uh, some of the, the people who were involved with that were not here, so... Um, Maybe I'll say it again next week, but um, but we're going to continue in our series that's not really a series. Um, uh, Normally, we at our church, we like to go through books of the Bible. We're going to just kind of run through it, feel like it's a really good way to learn God's word, uh, to see what he says to the the person that this, whoever authored that book, um, who they're writing it to, why they're writing it. It helps us understand what God is saying for us. But at times it's good to step back and start looking at some themes, uh, some, some key truths that the Bible presents. And I, I thought it was good that we would sit this year as the beginning of this year to remind ourselves of some foundational things. Uh, some of you remember those things. Some of you are like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but let's go, let's go. Um, uh, but the first week of this year, we, start, we looked at Psalm 19, and we reminded ourselves that the foundation of our salvation is God's love for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. And we looked at Psalm 19 with a different lens, right? This psalm that could be easily misconstrued as in, here are some steps to have a good happy spiritual life. Follow these things and everything's going to go well with you. And that is the bad way to read that psalm. The better way to read that psalm is, I am in need and the Lord provides. I am in need of restoration and God's word provides that. 
I am in need of being able to truly see, and the Lord's word provides that. I am in need of hope, and the Lord's word provides that. And then the next week we looked at and say, well, hey, if, if, if the foundation of our salvation is, is the love of God, what helps us become mature? What is, what is the engine driving our maturity before the Lord? We are, we are not called to be infants all the time. God redeems us, he justifies us, he sanctifies us, and we're called to progress in our walk with the Lord. What drives that? Well, it's our love for Jesus. Our love for Jesus drives our maturity. He secured us completely through his work. And as we grow in our love for him, we desire to do the things that he wants us to do. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And, and Jesus, speaking to something that is, that is just foundational in life of, of humans, is that we all make our decisions based on what we love. So you start looking at the things you have around you, how you order your life, how, you know, the decisions that you buy. Uh, all of that goes around what I actually love. What is most valuable to me? What's most important to me? And Jesus is calling his people to place him as supreme. You are my, my first love. You are the one who takes priority over my life. And so if your word is calling me to something that I don't necessarily want to do, but you want me to do it, I want to do it. And so I will step and do the thing that I'm not necessarily thrilled about doing because I know it's for you and therefore I'll be thrilled about doing it. So as I'm living and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, I'm seeking and, I'm, and I'm, I'm following the Lord, the more my love grows for him, the more he's growing his love in me, the closer I'm going to want to be with him. The more I'm going to abide with him, and the more I'm going to see him working through me. Now, the next week we looked at, or last, this is last week, the, the application of that maturity. How is, how is that maturity revealed in itself? Well, it's revealed within the body. It's revealed within how we're, we're acting and responding to one another. I can say I'm a mature Christian, but as soon as someone gets on my nerves, I blow a fuse, it really speaks contrary to the fact that I'm a mature, mature Christian. Right? They will know you by your love. Right? This is God's desire for us is that we would work out our salvation amongst each other. So we're reading through Ephesians. And we're seeing that there's the spiritual maturity can never be achieved in isolation. Like we, we can't do this on our own. We can't just hide our lives, stand back, and, and try to work everything out within us on our own. Me and the Lord, it just doesn't work that way. He's not designed us that way. He's designed us to be part of his body, not a separate body unto ourselves. And so... Everything that we have when we're in a big group like this or in small group, all of the interactions we have with, with believers, all of them are opportunities for us to either show the love of Christ or receive it from someone else. And we, we need to view ourselves and view our life like that. That my job is to hold truth. It is to know truth. It is to apply truth. But it is not to take truth as a weapon to bash other people down. I'm to take that truth and then I'm to apply it in the way the Lord has applied it to me. To bear with one another. Like Paul says in Galatians 6 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is what? Love one another as I have loved you. So, all those things um, are, I think, not new things. Those are common things that most of us know, but we definitely need reminder. And this week, I want to kind of finish up this series that's not a series um, with just a description of where we are and what we can expect in this life. 
uh, I think expectations are are something that can be uh, beneficial to us or detrimental to us, depending on their connection to reality. Right? Any of you who have been in a relationship with someone for a long time understand this. Uh, I can expect my spouse to do something, but if it's not within the realm of who they are, I'm going to be let down with that expectation. And I'm going to experience dissatisfaction with the relationship. This is kind of what you go through in premarital counseling, right? We've got to set expectations. There is no other person who can fulfill you or do the things that the Lord himself is only designed to do. So, but if I set my expectations in the right place, then I can have fullness of joy in my relationship. Because I'm not putting weights on things that were not intended to have them. And I think there's something in our life that we expect that oftentimes creates dissonance with us. And I don't think my wife is leaving right now because I <laughs> said something. Uh, <laughs> we're trying to put the baby in the nursery and uh, she's not liking it. Her expectations are not, the, not, the, uh, not, what, uh, not what it is. Um, but there, there are things in life that we, we expect them to be either voiced or unvoiced. And when they don't happen, it creates uh, discord within our life. One thing that I feel like, or I think that most of us expect, is that if I'm walking with the Lord for a long time, if I'm spiritually mature, I'm not going to have struggles with my faith. I'm not going to have the deep sorrowful, painful struggles that I'm currently having if I finally arrive. If I'm really mature in life, then there can be storms around, but I'm just going to be good. I'll be happy-go-lucky just walking around and having a great time. And that's not what the Bible presents. In fact, the Bible presents that we will struggle through this life. That this life is not designed for us to find our satisfaction in. We will struggle in this life. But God works through our struggle, and he allows us to exercise our faith in the struggle. He meets us where we are in our struggle, and he calls us to be vigilant against it. Why is this? Well, because we're living in a time of spiritual war, not peace. And I think that the derailment of many people's faith finds itself in the fact that they believe they were in a time of spiritual peace when they were in a time of spiritual war. My uh, kids and I are reading a... Um, are reading a, a book. Some of you may have heard of it. It's called The Hobbit. Um, and we're really enjoying it. It's one of those books that if dad doesn't read it at night, there is some problems with the kids. And um, we're at the point in the book, and I'm just going to spoil something for someone, but that's on you. It's been out for a while. Um, <laughs> where the the hobbit and the, the dwarves, 12 dwarves who come through, they, they come and they, uh, they get through this forest, the Mirkwood forest. They're in some barrels, just beaten, battered, washed up on the shore, and they're hungry, they're tired, and they're coming to Lake Town, this town that the, that's in the shadow of the lonely mountain where the former king under the mountain, the former dwarf king is coming back to reclaim his treasure that was stolen by the dragon. And they come up and they walk to this city that's built on a lake that is guarded by some guards on this pier that walks out to it. And they walk up and they get there unnoticed. And they walk up and they come to these guys who are supposed to be guarding everything, but don't see them because they're busy drinking and having a good time. They were not being vigilant. Now, it wasn't a bad thing. It's not like the town was overrun by the doors. They actually become like help to them. But 
The illustration is that we oftentimes can miss what's going on and we can be caught surprised when we are not being vigilant to what we're doing. Now, why were these people not being vigilant? Well, because for years and years and years, we've just been sitting here. No one comes out here anymore. The dragon drove everyone off. Trade's not that bad. We're not even a town that's really worth protecting. So I know we got our job. We're just going to hang out. We're going to have a party every night. It's the same old, same old, you know? And they missed the king coming, this little ragtag group coming to uh, defeat Smog. And they missed it because they weren't vigilant. And I think for us in our Christian life, we miss things oftentimes because we're not vigilant. And I think 1 Peter chapter 5 describes that. So this is where we're going to start today. It's not where we're going to be the whole day. Um, and I'm just going to make an apology to all you note takers. I didn't, do not have a PowerPoint today. Um, but the Lord says you must forgive me. So um, you're just going to have to pay a little closer attention. Um, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will, will, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So I'm going to have one point today. So if you want to write this down, we're going to have one point. Uh, or, and then a question. Uh, and here's the point. I'm just going to lay it out for you. Struggling in our faith does not necessarily reveal that something is wrong. Struggling in our faith does not necessarily reveal that something is wrong, but that the battle is not yet over. Struggling in our faith does not necessarily reveal that something is wrong, but that the battle is not yet over. See, Peter is speaking to a people who are enduring intense persecution. He's gone through his letter trying to encourage and uplift them and speak to them, and he ends his letter with this statement. After all this stuff's going on, everything that you're experiencing, everything that's going on, humble yourself before the Lord. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought don't put yourself in a, in a place where you can grin and bear it and you can do it all, you can take it all. No, humble yourself before the Lord. Come to the Lord, abide with Him, lean on Him, rescue, find your rescue in Him. Seek Him. Because He's the one who's going to be able to exalt you. You cast your anxieties on Him, I know you're going to have them. I know they're going to be there, but you bring them to him. But then you do what? You be sober-minded, watchful. There is an adversary out there. There is an enemy out there. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy what, what God's been doing in you. He will use any means necessary to do so. His job is to cause you to doubt the goodness and faithfulness of God in your life. He started it in the garden. He's continued it throughout history. He will continue doing it. He's extremely stubborn. But you're called to resist him. 
Be sober-minded, be watchful, and resist him. See, we are living in a wartime. We, we are not living in peacetime. And I'm not talking about politically. I'm not talking about stuff that's going on in the world. Actually, I would just probably say, turn off the news for a while. It may be helpful to your soul. But spiritually speaking, we are at war. That war is won, but battles continue going. Christ is already, already a victor over everything, but he's left us here while he, we're awaiting him to return. Like Gandalf on that white horse coming in uh, in the end of the Lord of the Rings. Right? We are waiting for our king to return. And while we are waiting for him to return, he is sought fit to leave us in a battlefield. A battlefield that is things on the outside, things on the inside, things that are constantly trying to derail what the Lord is doing in us. And if we're not careful to keep that in the forefront, it can be detrimental to our life. But there's two truths that we need to hold at all time. Right? Christ has already won. His victory is his. I mean, you sing that song, I'm fighting a battle, you've already won. Right? That's such an encouraging song because it reminds us while we're going through emotional turmoil, physical turmoil, turmoil with other people, all the stuff that's going on in life, loss of what I, I hope I would have had and I don't have, all that stuff, he has already won. While that's being held, I am not done yet fighting. And I really, really want to, but I am not yet done fighting. And Peter is saying, look, guys, here is reality. Here's where your expectations need to be. Here's where you need to adjust yourself. You will not find your rest in this world. You will only find it in Christ. And you will have things that are coming against you all the time to destroy you. But they won't destroy you because God will keep you. But if you don't look, look out, it will be detrimental to you. And insofar we think that we're going to find everything that we want in this life, it's going to be destructive to us. So disillusionment often comes when our expectations of life are not in line with reality. And Christ calls us to have this sober, watchful mindset to the schemes of the enemy. Now, when I say that, there is always this temptation to say, well, man, I've really messed up. I, I, how am I ever going to get this? I'm, I, 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 I just, frustration with my own ability. And I think what's encouraging is to look back at saints who've gone in the past, who've lived life, who we would look like, look at and say that person is, is mature and see what they were struggling through in life. Right? If you read the, through the Psalms, you read through David, uh, you, you read what this man who is called a man after God's own heart. You read his, his struggles in life. Right? Psalm 11. Why, why do you say to me, flee like a bird to the mountains? Why are you, why are you telling me to, to go run away from the problem that is in front of me? Hope in God. I will praise Him. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Psalm 42, 43, 46. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. I, the psalm I read this morning, Psalm 34. As for me, my feet nearly slipped. Like this is after uh, David is saying, hey, look, praise the Lord. His praise will be continually on my, on my lips, in, in my mouth. My soul makes boast in the Lord. I will praise him all the time. 
Taste and see that the Lord is good. I almost fell. But the Lord rescues. At the end of that psalm, he says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of all of them. He keeps his bones. None of them are broken. Affliction will slay the wicked. Those who hate righteousness will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. You look at our Savior. He's the perfect Son of God. Right? He's, he's perfect, sinless. What is he doing right before his crucifixion? He's asking to get a way out. He's wrestling internally, struggling in anguish with the, with the work that he has to do. He overcomes. He goes through it. But the immense emotional pressure on him was so much so that he was sweating drops of blood. And he endured it and went through it. Paul, the the man who says, um, Philippians 4, 6 through 7, most of us have this memorized. Be anxious for what? Nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, make your requests made known to God, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. Right? Wonderful verse to memorize. Paul himself, in another letter to another church that we just finished a few months ago, 2 Corinthians, He's listing off in chapter 11 all these things that he goes through. Sleepless nights, tortures, imprisonments, beatings, pressure. And on top of all of this, there's this great anxiety that I have for the churches that I'm carrying with myself. This internal struggle and pressure in my life that I am wrestling with. I'm fighting with it. It's difficult. In fact, uh, turn your Bibles to, to Romans chapter, chapter 8. Many of you have this memorized, uh, maybe. Um, but the end of, end of Romans chapter 8, this, this beautiful statement on our security in the Lord and what he's done for us. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all? How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall uh, tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it's written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither life, nor death, angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Right? This beautiful statement. We cannot be separated from our Savior. What does Paul say in the next chapter? I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My my conscience bears with me witness with the Holy Spirit that I have a great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I wish my myself would be accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers and my kinsmen according to the flesh. In all these things we are more than conquerors, I am struggling deeply within my heart 
at the situation that I'm in. I can't control it. I can't fix it. My brothers and sisters are perishing and I can't do anything about it. And I wish that I could do something about it, but I'm struggling deeply with my faith in there. Paul, the apostle, the mature disciple, struggling with the reality of what's going on in life. Struggling is not abnormal. It just means the battle's not over yet. And I don't know about you, but for me, that is extremely encouraging. Because I struggle over big things and I struggle over really stupid things. And it can cause... Discord in the soul. I should be doing this better. I got the degrees. I shouldn't have these struggles. No, I should. Why? Because it's not about how much you know. It's not about how strong you are. It's about the fact that you are in a battle, in a war zone, and the Lord is walking with you, showing that he will come through. And the timing through which he comes through and the problem that you have is never the timeline that you want it to be. But it is always the perfect time for you in the thing that you are going through. None of us get to pick our struggles. None of us do. But the constant is that we have them. Our Savior himself, in that discourse that we spent a lot last three weeks in, the upper room discourse, after he tells them, love one another, I'm going to give you a helper, I will be with you. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And then he takes an entire chapter praying to the Father to say, Lord, don't take them out of the world. Help them in it. Preserve, preserve them in it. Keep them in it. Keep them unified. Walk with them as they're going through the difficulty. I know exactly what they're about to go through. And it hurts me. It pains me. I know what's going to happen. But I love them. And I will be with them. And I will be with you. So if you're struggling, you haven't missed it. If you're struggling... You're still alive. If you're struggling, it's because you're not yet home. And man, what hope is there? I mean, I I feel like I really identify with Bilbo Baggins. I'm just going to, this is, I guess, the sermon with, uh, with the Hobbit, so um, it doesn't happen often, but. Because he liked his things the way they were. He liked his ease and his comfort. He didn't go on big, grand adventures, but he liked his food, and he liked to have an easy life. Then he made a, just a crazy decision when a bunch of crazy dwarves came in, He's like, okay, I guess I'm going. And then he immediately is like, what have I done? And he's going through this, this journey, going into all these perils where life is about to be. I mean, he almost got eaten by some, some uh, I don't know what they were called, trolls, um, or eaten by goblins, or eaten by golem, or killed by some elf, eaten by spy. And this guy keeps on trying to get eaten. It's It's crazy. He just keeps on longing for the place where he had the peace. But the journey is not yet over. I mean, I think that's why the Pilgrim's Progress has been such a, 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 a deeply impactful book for many. Because it's the same story. I'm seeking a homeland. 
I'm going for somewhere that is not here. I really wish the things in this place were better than they were. But they're not. They're not intended to be. I mean, even silly things. I don't, here, I'm a, I'll put myself out of her embarrassment. I had to get rid of my truck recently. And you, yeah, I know, I know, it's really sad. Um, but I really liked that truck. It was an old rusty Toyota. And I wanted to drive it forever. But it did not want to be driven forever. <laughs> now, the engine's still going, because it's a Toyota, and it probably will go until the Lord returns. Um, but I really, I really was sad about that. Like, I felt I put, put down a dog when I got rid of it. And, uh, yeah, you're, everyone's like, man, I'm not sure I want to come back to this, this church. This guy's crazy. Um, I'm like, but Lord, like, where am I putting my value? And in what ways have I allowed the enemy or my own flesh to come in and steal away what you're doing within my heart and within our midst? And three years in Delaware. The Lord is doing great things through our church. The Lord is showing up. He's working. He's encouraging us. He's coming and encouraging me through various ways. Through People had no idea they were encouraging me in the way they were saying or what that was going on. But he's speaking and doing things. And the eyes can look towards the loss or the eyes can look towards the Lord. And if you're not vigilant, you'll miss it. So if you're struggling with your faith, if you're struggling with the big thing, Lord, I believed you. I followed you. I've done all these things. I've been with you my entire life. Why is this happening now? Be strong. Or rather, go to the one who has the strength. Remember, your journey is not done yet. Be village, vi vigilant. Keep watch. The battle is not over yet. There will be a day when there is peace. There will be a day when there is no more struggle. There will be a day when everything as is as it should be. No cancer diagnosis, no loss no pain, no wish, no struggle within myself. Today is not today. Today is the day we learn where we need to be and who we need to cling on to. So my question I want to leave with you today, and that you just take this week, am I being vigilant? Am I being vigilant? Now, I want to break that down in two parts, kind of like we did last week, right? My loving one another is both an opportunity to show someone the love of God and then to receive the love of God from someone else, to give someone the opportunity to do so. My vigilance is not just for myself. If I understand that I am in a war... I'm in a battle, that I'm in a, I'm in a bunker with a bunch of other people who are terrified out of their shoes. I'm not even sure if that's a phrase, but if it is, it's a new one. There we go. <laughs> then when I am feeling confident, I can remind my brother or sister who's not. And then when I'm feeling not confident... I can say, okay, Lord, I'm talking to you about this. I, I don't know what to do with what's going on in here. But I, I can't just keep this between us. I need to bring this to someone else that you can work through that person in my life. Right? And we begin to build what the Lord wants in his people. 
bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. When, when we're keeping that in our front, when we're understanding the battle that is here, we're going to be able to withstand what the enemy is trying to do in you. When he begins to try to steal, kill, and destroy, and you can't bear it up on your own, you have a brother or sister who is able. When you're going through a difficulty, diagnosis that you didn't think that you were going to have, there's a brother or sister who may be able to speak into your life who's had the same thing happen in their own life. Or rather, it would be the conduit through which the Lord encourages you. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. He knows your struggle. He knows your affliction. He is with you in all of it. He is walking with you. He is guiding you. He is caring for you. He will make you come to the finish line. We simply need to recognize it, and cling to him, keep walking with him. So, am I being vigilant? It's a question you can answer for yourself. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you that you love us. Lord, if you did not, we would be hopeless. But you do. You care for us. You know our struggles. You know the overwhelmingness of life at times. And you have the power to sustain, redeem, and renew. Or keep our minds sober. Keep our eyes watchful. Keep us dependent on you. We trust you and praise you. In your name.